Oh, good. I didn't. I didn't lose you. <laughs> no, I'm here. Cool. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Sheppy. Um, welcome to Genealogy Adventures. This is, um, as it says, this is one of our special episodes. And today I am very, very so pleased to be able to say that we have our special guest, Catherine Knight, who's written a book called Unveiled, the 20 Odd, documenting the first African in England, America, between 1619 and 1625. This is her book. Okay. Let's close up. I can get it into get it into screen. Um, and I'm pleased to say the book came out for sale on Amazon on the 18th. So it is available for sale. And without further ado, I'm going to give a little bit of um, background on Catherine. And then so I'm going to probably ask you a couple of questions about your background. So Catherine is both a historian and an author. She has written numerous books, um, some excellent books about African-Americans in America. This is the latest book, um, which I love because it's, um, I'm going to literally say that this has saved me probably between five to eight years worth of research at a minimum. Uh, the level of research and detail that Catherine has done uh, for this book is just nothing, nothing short of a phenomenal. So Catherine, I'm going to ask you, how did you get into the whole, um, the whole history and, and writing? It actually started with genealogy. Before I became a hist historian, I was a genealogist, and probably from the age of three, my great-grandmother, um, she basically molded me and groomed me to become the keeper of the ancestors and pass down from her all the information to me. And we used to picnic in the cemetery, and she would tell me stories about every single person in that cemetery, which I could tell you today and recite, and even tell you the little emblem that was on the headstone, <laughs> because it was from the age of three, probably till five, and it was really put in, instilled in me at that point. Um, then life took over, you grow up, you get older, you have family, and then in 2006, um, my husband and I were really deep in the real estate market, and the real estate market crashed, and he looked at me and told me that I needed to get a hobby. And immediately I heard my great grandmother tell me that I needed to go back to my roots. But I didn't go back to mine, I went back to his really, because I knew my roots. Well, I thought I knew most of my roots. Some of it I didn't, I find out now. But he didn't know his grandfather. And that really was painful for me, not for him not to know his own grandfather. So I searched the records, I found um, his last, his line, which was a, the night line, and it went all the way back to Jamestown. And for Christmas of 2006, I gave him, my um, husband and his father, a genealogy, an ancestry line tree showing the, the um, genealogy all the way back to Jamestown. And at that point in time, he asked me, and this was Christmas Day 2006, he asked me about if I could find a lady who he recalled um, seeing at his grandmother's who he thought he was related to. And he thought her last name was Sweat, which it was. Um, but I went off on a whole new adventure with that, which is what led me 13 years later to this book and several others. Um, it's been quite the interesting journey. I, this lady that I followed led me all the way back to 1640 where I found um, the union of the line, which was between a woman named by the name of Margaret Cornish, who was one of the very first Africans to come to America um, in 1619 under English rule. Um, and with the actual document I found was a judgment for punishment of fornication. She had had um, an affair, and it actually was an extramarital affair, with a European gentleman by the name of Robert Sweat. And I was able to trace that line back, and um, I was able to realize that Margaret came from these first Africans. Now, I look at genealogy all the time. This woman grasps me. I could not get away from her. I would be driving in traffic, and she would be asking me questions. I could, it was, it was quite amazing. She, I felt like, needed to have her story told. And this is the product of Margaret Cornish's begging me to tell her history. 
And I'm so glad she did because that's someone that connects you and me. Because yes. I'm a descendant of Margaret Cornish. One of her descendants went to Northampton County, North Carolina, as a free person of color, and married into my Jossie family. Right. Um, I just want to say a couple of quick hellos. Hi, Harold. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Mary, and hello, Martha, and hello, Barbara. Again, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And so Margaret was on your, Margaret and the Sweat family was kind of your introduction to the whole uh, first Africans of Virginia. <laughs> and what kind of prompted you to, to start really writing about it and, and sharing, what you, sharing what you learned? Mostly it was exactly the, I couldn't get away from her. She was in my every thought. She was in my dreams. I would stare off into space. My husband would say, where are you? Well, I was in Virginia 400 years ago. Um, she, I feel like she demanded that my story be told, her story be told. Now with her story came the truth because I, I had to find the truth. I had to identify where she came from, how did she even get here? What brought her here? And then those three questions blew up into an enormous amount of work to figure out every perception or perceivable um, view of the story. And out of that, I visited five different countries' archives. Um, the, this, the story touches not only America and Africa, it touches five continents and eight different countries. And it's quite the international story that how they even arrived here in Virginia. And it needs to be told truthfully. So I went on in search of all the information. I compiled it um, specifically about these first Africans and unveiled the 20 and odd. Because the other series that I have written is Fate and Fiction, or excuse me, it's a fictional series called Fate and Freedom. Um, and that tale tells, it's about 95% factual, it tells the story of these first Africans um, from 1619 to 1676. And it's very poignant, but I had to call it out as fiction because it's written in first person. I wanted the reader to understand what these individuals went through, what they felt, the fear, the joy, whatever the reaction or what they went through, I wanted the reader to understand where they had been. It, it's, it gives you much more closeness to, to those individuals back then. And many, many, many people descend from them we're finding today. And I have, I have to say you do such a superb job. It's chapter eight. Um, I have bored Catherine to death <laughs> telling her about, I was so entranced about chapter eight, which actually talks about the journey of these people because I just thought, like many people probably did, that they came straight from Africa to Virginia. Their journey was anything but that. So the fact, you know, the, the detail and kind of the emotion that you, you write about that journey, about what happened to them. You know, they went to many different places before they rocked up in Virginia. And um, it, was, it was really just a roller coaster ride, a roller coaster ride actually, um, actually reading about that. Um, one thing, I'd really like to start with their origin story. Um, again, I didn't realize that they were Catholic. I didn't realize that the African kingdom that they came from had converted to Catholicism. Uh, I didn't realize that the kingdom that they came from had been very cosmopolitan, very connected internationally through, through trade routes. These were very cultured people. Because again, as an African American, I'm always told, oh, you know, Africans run around naked in, in mud huts which if that's their culture, that, that's fine. But these people were anything but that. And I'd just like you to spend a little time talking about the, the kingdom that they came from, and sorry, I can never remember how to pronounce it correctly, but a little bit about the kingdom that they, they came from and what their life would have been like back there. Their life would have been much more advanced than the people of Jamestown. Advanced, they were, many of them were literate, they could read, they could write, they could speak many language, languages, including European languages. Um, they could grow crops. They were educated in livestock. They were educated um, 
really in in much more in the ways of being able to sustain some type of livelihood, which they did. Um, they came from the kingdom of Ndongo, most of them. Now, the reason I say most of them is because the kingdom of Ndongo had an international market in the city of Kabasa, which was the basically the capital of Ndongo. However, it being an international market, I, we believe that they also could have been from the kingdom of Longo, which was just north of the kingdom of Congo. So we, now we have three kingdoms that probably they could come from. The reason I wanted to point that out, because we know one of the Africans took the last name of Longo. And that probably is def a, a, a throwback to his, where he came from. Um, there are several little tiny bits and pieces that we find that will give me a reference that leads back to such as um, Anthony Johnson, who was one of the major Africans in um, Virginia. He, his grandchild had a 300 acre um, farm in Maryland and he named it Angola. So there's little, little throwbacks to you know, give their country and where they came from identity still to this day. But they were, they could have been um, from other kingdoms, like I said, outside of Ndongo, but Ndongo was where they were actually raided. And when the Portuguese, Portuguese came through, they basically enslaved as many as they could. Many, many were killed. Um, they enslaved them. They force marched them to the, to, um, the port of Luanda. And there they held them until the ships arrived. And it just so happened that these specific Africans were put aboard the San Juan Batista, which is a Spanish ship, which is very important. For years, it's been called a Portuguese ship. is probably why many people couldn't trace it. Um, but it was a Spanish ship. But before it was a Spanish ship, it actually was a Japanese ship. So looking at, at the origin of of the entire story is very, very important from where they came from to how they got to Virginia. There are many, many factors that are involved in this story. Like you said, it, it, it's quite involved of what they go through to get here. In the street, you know, as with most history, there's just so many moving parts and there's definitely a lot of moving parts in this one. And I guess the impression that I got is when they finally arrived and they didn't all arrive together, they kind of arrived in stages. And again, I don't want to give too much away from the book, but some of them went to England and some of them were in Bermuda and they finally, you know, this group of people finally did arrive in, in Virginia. Talking in the, the our technical chat, I, you know, I made the point that they must have really felt as though they, they were literally in the wilderness, that they were living in a far more barbaric situation than what they had left behind than what they had left behind at home. And um, I just wonder how they must have coped with that and how they must have felt about that. They definitely were the most knowledgeable about being able to survive in the wilds of Virginia. I believe that that the client the climate in um, parts of Angola um, was very similar to Virginia's climate. Um, the temperatures, the dryness, the, the different seasons. So they had some knowledge. Now, not all of them came out of that international market. Many of them came because they were trading in that market. So they would bring livestock, they would bring different crops and stuff to trade. So there was a multitude of people um, that, that came. They did not all, like you said, they did not all come at one time. And there's one thing I would really like to clear up and put out there. The name of my book is Unveiled the 20 and Odd. That is really a play on words, if I say so myself. And the reason is because 20 and Odd was a very ambiguous statement. 20 and Odd actually never existed. Hmm. Um, when they originally land, landed, the first ones that landed in Virginia, there was only 14. And I tell you how we get to that number in the book. From that 14 figure, others are brought in with, in different, different ways, and we get to 32, which is what the census in March of 16, um, 1619 or 1620, what it, it refers to. Um, but that is, it's, it's a very um, twisted tale, and it was basically to keep 
the reason it was so twisted and there was so much cover up and it took so much to put the puzzles of the pieces back together was because of the fact that the money man behind the settlements of both Bermuda and Virginia, he had more money in ships that rivaled the king of England. He had the power and they had to cover him because if Virginia went down, Bermuda went down, all his money, he would have lost his head just like um, Sir Walter Raleigh had a year before. And it was because of the same man, the Spanish ambassador, whose name they called Gondomar, it was because of him that Sir Walter, Walter Raleigh lost his head. He was in the inner circle of King James's, um, his crown, so to speak. And this was the problem. Gondomar was now after the Earl of Warwick. So all of these stories were created. All of, uh, there's a lot of evidence you have to actually look at to see who, who supplied you with the evidence, who was speaking, who was taking the testimony. You have to really look because there are sides, there are definite factions that went on and there, you can really see whose side who was on. And in my book, I try to relate each person that had a part in it and whose side that they were on in the cover-up that they did. So it gets very, con it's, 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 it's <laughs> very convoluted at, at, at points, even. It just strikes me as crazy that you have this real kind of um, early, early colonial, colonial settlement that's pay playing these kind of big league European power games. You know, and part of the fallout of that was the, um, the, the first Africans in, in Virginia. And the other thing that I kind of wanted to mention earlier on in the segment was the penny really kind of dropped for me about the time period that we're talking about, 1619, 1620. And I was really kind of thinking about it because I, as I shared with you, I'm, I'm part, you know, I've got a little bit of um, Pamunkey um, Native American, which is that part of Virginia that they were in. So th as, we, as we were chatting about, kind of right before this happened, it had been a whole series of conflicts with the Native Americans and the colonists because the Native Americans by that point had had enough. They would have been quite happy if they could have pushed all the colonists into the ocean and call it a day, which I kind of get because colonists were starting to really encroach on Native American lands. So by that point, just before 1619, the Native Americans were no longer giving that kind of assistance that they gave. They weren't teaching about how to grow crops, when you know when to when to till, when to plant, when to you know all the machinations that go with with grow, with uh, growing produce, and they weren't really helping as well with um, teaching about animal husbandry. So then all of a sudden you have at least in the beginning fourteen individuals who knew that stuff, who could teach the white and you know the European indentured servants how to do all of this stuff because as we know the great and the good in the colony, they weren't getting their hands dirty. They weren't having any of that stuff. So that's what the intentioned servants were for. And really, you know, Jamestown as a colony, after, especially after the, the Native Americans rose up um, in 1622 and slaughtered so many of them, if it hadn't have been for the, the first Africans in Virginia, the, the colony probably would have failed because the Europeans just didn't have that skill set. That is exactly right. And as we were talking earlier, um, I wanted to prove that point because I've had a lot of resistance. I've like, there's, I've heard there's no way they could have done that. And of course they all want to say that they were enslaved. They did whatever the white man said, but that I wanted, I wanted to make sure I had portrayed it properly. So what I did is I took the list of the living, which was documented in February 23rd, 169, or excuse me, 1623. It was almost a year after the um, Indian uprising, the native um, uprising or the massacre, which a lot of people call it. I looked at each person that was listed on that document and I determined when they arrived in Virginia. Most of them had, had arrived, I would say all but 10% had arrived in Virginia within the last year or so. Now with them arriving in Virginia, they were arriving off the streets of England 
They didn't know how to grow in, grow anything. They didn't know how to grow corn on the Straits of England. They probably couldn't take care of themselves. That's why they probably in, ended up either in a facility that sent them to England or they had been orphaned. There was many orphans that had, had, had arrived. But by 1623, between 1619 and 1623, 4,600 people had arrived as indentured servants in Virginia. By the end of that time period, all but 100 had died. There had been 4,500 of the 4,600 that had died. Now, those people that were left, when you look at them, and they have only been there a year or so, what did they give or what did they provide to be able to have any knowledge to grow food, to provide livestock, any type of existence, they, I'm certain that they had no, no clue of how that was done. So hopefully I challenge those now that have, that come to me and say, how can you say that, that it was, you know, there was only 30 Africans there in the colony or whatever they want to say, look at the documentation, look at the people, do the genealogy on these people, see when they arrived, see what they knew, because most of them knew nothing. The Africans saved that colony, or we would have been sitting in um, South Canada. Yep. And the other thing that I really note that I noted, and I don't know why the light kind of switched on to that, at that point. And again, thinking about the Native American attack on on the colony, none of the Africans were actually killed. No. I mean, they, they, like I said, they killed hundreds of, of European settlers, but not one African. And I find that really, really, not only interesting, but very, but very curious about why that was. The only I can say is it's possible they could relate to them. I, I don't really have an answer for you on that. I do, I've read in other books that, that they've been noted that they thought maybe that they, the Africans were ghost-like, which I don't really buy into that. Um, but you never know back then, 400 years ago, there was a lot of beliefs back then that we certainly don't have today. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Um, now, I do want to get into one of the little side trips that three individuals in particular went on, because I, I find it fascinating. Um, and again, it was the, the, the Margaret Cornish um, angle that kind of entranced me to begin with. But three of the Africans were actually taken to England before they ever arrived in Virginia. And to say that my mouth dropped open at that point is an understatement. Especially for you being from England <laughs> and having no idea. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. They, they were taken or they were put on the James, which was the Earl of Warwick's ship in Bermuda by um, Governor Butler at the time. He would he put them on three of them on the ship, sent them to the port of Southampton. They were taken from there to Lee's Priory, which was the Lord, um, the Earl of Warwick's estate. And from there, they one of them at least we know was was they tried to prompt him in every way they could for him to testify on their behalf. However, when he testified. Um, they didn't like what he had to say because he, they were trying to, to, to get him to say that there was only one ship that pirated the ship he was on, which was San Juan Batista, but it was only one ship. However, it wasn't, it was two. It was the Earl of Warwick's ship, the treasurer and the white lion that did it. There was two ships there. He was on the treasurer, Anthony, who they were trying to testify or get to testify that there was only one ship. The reason they were trying to do this was to clear the Earl of Warwick so he wouldn't lose his head. It was all about the cover for this one um, very wealthy man. <laughs> yeah, the two words that immediately spring to mind are skullduggery. I love that word. It's so old fashioned, but it is really apt for this story. And um, Machiavellian, just Machiavellian. Again, especially with the, the whole kind of power play politics that were going on at the time. And I wanted to spend also um, a little more time actually speaking about some of the individuals, because again, um, history is, has not been kind to them in terms of withholding information about who they were as people and kind of what they were capable of achieving. 
And things that really struck a chord with me in the book were learning about two of them were quite adept at legal matters. They were actually helping, they not only got out of their indentured service sooner than they were supposed to have because they bought themselves out, they were actually actively assisting either some of the first Africans or the sons and daughters of those first Africans to get out of their indentures a lot earlier. And one of them um, was we seeing... Mark, I'm sorry, one of them was Margaret Cornish's first husband, who was John Gowan. He went to York, York County and he did a lot of, of legal work there. And, and um, he, some people say he became a bailiff. I say he became more of a clerk because a lot of information has his, has his actual signature on it. You can go and get a copy of it. The other one was Benjamin Dahl, and he was from Surrey County, and he helped both African and Europeans with legal affairs. Um, they were both very, very knowledgeable within the English legal system, which was unheard of. And it's just important that we get this information of how exceptional they were because it leads us into slavery. The things that they did trying to keep their heads above water so that they didn't enter into slavery and to protect themselves and their children is what actually led the laws to enslave the ones from the, that would come in in the future, the African. So it, it's kind of a twisted tale. It's, it's what comes from it is very sad that these people prevailed under horrible circumstances, um, both in their lives, in what they did, helping others. They became very prominent citizens. One of them had was the number one horse breeder in all of Virginia, and he had very well sought after horses. Um, there were there were cattle barons, as you like to call them. Um, the Johnsons, and there were several of them that were, but they had to record everything in the, in the legal system. So it was important that those two Africans knew the legal system, and that's what they did. They documented everything, whether it was a transfer between a, a father and a son, a transfer between two Africans, whether it was a transfer between an Englishman and an African. It all went in the court system so they could verify, number one, that the cow wasn't stolen, whose it was, make sure they got paid. And that was the biggest thing was the money to make sure that they were um, given what they deserved from, you know, the, the contracted price for the whatever it was that they were purchasing. But there's a lot of information in those in those early records um, that really ties us. Now they say, oh, the genealogy of it all. The genealogy was tough, I have to say. Originally when I started, my husband made me a map that fit on the whole wall. And it was a Virginia only. <laughs> um, but from that map, I had to put little pins in the pin head. I would attach a little note to who it was, how they moved, where they were at specific times. And that made the puzzle come together a lot easier um, because they really, you can, you can watch them um, as, they, as they grow from 16, 19, and many of them were children because they live into 1680s and 90s. And so they had to have been children back then. No one lived that long. So, um, but what we find from them is, is quite amazing, their journey in life, and it's time that the truth about them is really revealed and told properly. So that was uh, Don, Donya says hello. She's on her way oh, home. Oh, hi. She's on her way home from work. <laughs> and yeah, I'm so sorry. That she, I'm just so sorry she couldn't be with be with us today. Um, but going back to what you were saying, one of the things that I was absolutely frustrated with, and if I was frustrated with it, and you said you were, I can only imagine how they must have felt that every achievement, especially the people who understood the legal system, which I lived in England for 30 years. I know how convoluted and how difficult it can be navigating that legal system. It was even worse back in the 17th century. Labyrinthine is just the, the word that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. but they, they did, they, they triumphed and they used the, the law of the land to achieve what they needed to achieve. And then as soon as they achieved it, the colonial government is right behind them trying to close that door, saying, well, we're gonna let you squeak through, but we're not gonna let anyone else squeak through this way. 
Well, and let me tell you how important they were to the English. In, by, from, when they arrived in 1619, not a single plantation had made a dime. Now, I know they didn't have dimes back there, but they had made no profits. Um, by 1621, the two plantations that the Africans are noted on which is Governor um, Yardley and Abraham Piercy's, those two plantations for the first time begin to show a profit. Um, then the Yardley plantation builds a windmill. I mean, there were several things that began to happen and they began to prosper. And who the knowledge came from was unquestionably the Africans. So, <laughs> They couldn't, those, the Europeans didn't want to lose what they had. They had never made a profit and that was all they could see. That, and that I believe was, you know, the Africans, I believe with everything it took them to get to Virginia, they were supposed to be here, but slavery wasn't supposed to exist. And slavery was never supposed to raise its ugly head because those first Africans literally saved America. And we, America has always been said supposedly to be the, you know, God's what kingdom or God's greatest gift or I don't, whatever it is. But they, all the cogs in the wheel, it took those Africans to get here because if one thing didn't happen, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been here. And there's a lot, as you know, that happened during that story to get them here. Mm. So in the big scheme of things, those Africans, I feel like they were meant to be in America and they saved North, the, they saved Virginia um, settlement without question. What happened later because of the seven deadly sins, the greed that came along with the profits for the Virginia company of them seeing them where the Africans were, that's what caused the seven deadly sins of slavery to rear its ugly head. Because um, again, in the tech, the tech check, I made the comment that, and again, I'm, I'm always remembering that they were Catholic. And there's, yes. there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on on that one, is that they must have felt as though they were the new Israelites being expelled from their, from basically their promised land. Um, and there's, there is a backstory to that. <clears throat> to, to cut a very long story short, um, and Catherine does a, an excellent job in, in keeping it quite concise. You know, they had a very young, inexperienced king who followed a very powerful ruler. And basically, enemy states took advantage of that. So I'm just imagining just the hell it must have been to have had their kingdom invaded. Everyone, either, as you said, either killed or enslaved. And it didn't matter if it was the, the wealthy, the elite, the royal family, or the, the workers. They were all caught up in this. So to be taken from a land that they knew and that they loved, and that was their homeland, to be shipped to this strange, <laughs> this strange continent, they didn't even know where they were on the map. They had no idea, none. Um, they really must have felt like they were the, the kind of incarnation of the biblical Is Israelites. That's just kind of, the, that's how I'm picturing it in my head. They, very possibly, I feel like they had, they had to have felt there was nobody else that could save this place. And they had been brought to literally the wilds of Virginia. The natives were, were killing people. Can you imagine the trauma and the fear that they went through from the time that they, their own kingdom was raided all the way into their entire existence, what they went through. And it, it's very important also to understand Slavery, they, when they were brought here, yes, they had been enslaved. When they landed in Virginia, they were no longer slaves. They were, actually they were maritime contraband because there was a, a court case that was coming between Gondomar and the Earl of Warwick. And if, think about what, how would, how would you, would you want to be, um, be, it to be known that you were holding maritime contraband? And that these, you could go to jail for it if they, they could not have treated them as slaves. So when they arrived, they arrived here and they became, they still didn't become indentured servants until probably 1620 or 1628 when two of the important people died, which was Yardley and Piercy, the ones that had them to begin with. When they died, 
it, then they went into an indentured servitude, then they became head rights, then they owned their own land, then they, they sold cattle, they became cattle barons like we talked about. But it's important to know that, that um, they weren't slaves like, like Jamestown is, is, has portrayed for years. When they came, they became basically an indentured servant. Um, the important thing is with an, in, what the difference was, yes, I'm sure they were treated horribly. Every indentured servant, regardless where you came from, was treated bad. Um, but they had an end date to that contract, and those Africans used that end date with that indenture, and they learned, like we said, how to, to manipulate to become landowners and follow that legal system and, and prove t- to the Europeans that they could beat them, really, at their own game, because they did. Um, the, I forget what we, the question specifically you asked me, I went on a rant there. Um, it's more of an observation. <laughs> Just basically saying that how they must have felt as though they were the, kind of the, the, the incarnation of the b- biblical Israel. Which um, brings me to my next point. When I was reading that part of your book, I was what, you know, and again, keeping the Catholic thing in mind, I kept thinking, I kept asking myself, where is the Pope in all of this? Where Where is the Church of Rome? Why isn't the Church of Rome speaking out against this? Because it's quiet, it's silent. There, there is nothing coming from that quarter whatsoever. No, there wasn't. And I don't, I believe that, well, back then they believed that if you hadn't been baptized, that yes, they could enslave you. That, that Now I'm going back probably to the 1500s. I see that a lot. But these people, like you say, they were Catholics. Now, did the Pope know that they were actually enslaving them? I can't say yes or no, but he did know one thing. He divided Africa, gave the Western half to the Portuguese and gave the Eastern half to to the Spanish to go in and basically colonize. So he knew something of it. Now, whether he knew what was happening to them I would think, yes, of course he knew because he was, he knew as much as kings knew. This was a contract. They were contracted to take them sl- the slaves out. Um, 36 ships left that summer. 30 went to Brazil. Six went to um, Veracruz. Five made it. One was pirated, which is the ship that we know about, of course. So it's, it's a lot to reflect on. Um, but I definitely think the Pope knew. He had to have known. Why I don't, did he do anything? I don't know. I don't see how he couldn't have. But I'm um, turning it back to a more positive uh, frame of mind. Um, when do you actually start seeing, you know, when they start uh, being freed from their indentured, or I, it's probably more accurate to say when they bought themselves out of their indentured servants early, when do you really start seeing them forming communities in, in uh, Virginia, in places like Surrey and Northampton County and, and Mecklenburg? That's a great question. What, okay, I said a while ago when two of the main people died, Governor Yardley, he died in 16, late 1627, early 1628, and so did Abraham Piercy, who was the other one that had the bulk of them. When they died at the same time, um, well, one year later, or one year earlier, um, Gondomar, had died. That when Gondomar died, it closed the court case that was open. So basically, at that point, they no longer were maritime contraband. They were now just servants in Virginia. But at that time, they also didn't, as a servant in Virginia, they didn't have a contract. So they indentured themselves because from 1628, if you go exactly seven years later, which is 1635, seven years was the average length of the of the servitude contract. Seven years later, we find them being released. One of them says um, from his master, it was from a con- basically a contract from his, thine own hand, meaning he had written an indenture with him. Um, at that point, and from 1635 to 16, about 38, 1640, 1640 is getting a little late, but during, from 1635 to 1638, we see a lot of them becoming head rights which now that basically is putting their name on a deed saying that they also have, um, have this piece of property, that their name is listed there. And that is ways that we can trace them um, because some of the Africans weren't listed on the censuses. 
the, because early on it just showed 23. We can actually come up with about 28 of them um, by names. So it doesn't, they're not all listed on those early censuses, but they are listed on the documents with the land deeds, the land patents that we can find in the public records. So that gave us a lot more clue um, as to where <clears throat> they were. Now, which leads me to my next question, because a lot of the counties that they were concentrated in, um, Henrico being one and Charles City County being another, both of those are heavily burnt counties. Um, Jamestown itself was a heavily burnt town. Um, how difficult was it to find actual surviving records from that time period? Very difficult. There's nothing there in those counties because they were destroyed. So we looked to outside um, references, really. And this is where cluster genealogy comes into play. That is what I used doing, doing the research for this project. I did anyone that came in contact with the Africans. I did cluster genealogy on basically, or I did genealogy on them, which is called what we refer to as cluster genealogy. It puts the pieces of the puzzle back together. I might find a will in England or a ship manifest in England that, that gave me a name, but it only gives me a name. But then I can, just by the little bits and pieces, I'm able to put that back together of how they got from one place to the other. There were several Africans in Northampton County um, that went from about through four different, they called them masters back then, through four different people. But you can, if you look at who these people are, you can see that basically they were just being um, passed down through family documentation from wills. You can look at the wills of the people and, and literally they're going to their family. They all stay within those family units too. Those first people where they, who they worked for, so to speak, if they didn't have work on their own plantation, some of them worked for others. And when they worked for those others, they wanted to retain them. They wanted them to work there, and I would have to think that they would have given them many, many liberties. Um, I know one gentleman was, his name was Francis Payne. He was given half the profits of, um, of the crops that were grown on another woman's property. So there's, you have to look at the little tiny bits and pieces, and literally it comes together, but it, it Remember the map I told you about? That was most helpful to figure out who was where and how they maneuver through these societies. And a lot of them stayed together. They stayed together. There was in Surrey County, you found the bulk of them. You found a lot of them in Northampton County or Accomack County. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, right or not. Um, but those two counties on the eastern shore, the bulk of them ended up there. And they made their own type of um, neighborhood that existed. Now, from that period of time, I take all the ones that are there and I literally can trace their genealogy because they move in communities. I can trace their genealogy how, and have them moving south into North Carolina and it's all those exact same names. So that also becomes very helpful when you start seeing them and they're interacting. They marry amongst themselves. So it's, it's really easier to track them than what you think because you're not going to find them in a census other than those first two or three early censuses. You're not going to find their names written in um, birth records or death records or any of those. They don't exist. So we literally just have to go back and piece these little bits of the puzzle back together. And those head right um, documents and the, the tax records are really only going to tell you so much. And really, they're only going to tell you about the, the head of the household. They're not going to tell you about anyone else, really, who was, I mean, the, I guess the head rights would be different, even though it wouldn't have names. You, the head you, rights actually gives a name. Um, actually, Margaret has a head right, and this is down the road since we're talk, we talked about Margaret. Her youngest son's name with, was Anthony. In, in 1645, he was born. In 1652, his name was on a head right with her on a patent, which to me is very interesting. He could have only been seven years old, but his name was on there. So that was, to me, was very interested to make, they were making sure that they had their names and they guaranteeing the freedom of being passed on to their children and to their um, descendants. They had a lot of foresight. 
That well, that I guess well, it makes sense that that was their security. Yeah. And the other thing that really struck me from what from your writing is the communities that they founded in Virginia seem to have been very um, open, welcoming, inclusive communities. Because I'm thinking about my Kumbo ancestors and family who kind of joined those communities a couple of decades later, mm -hmm. the Mozingos who joined them a couple of decades later. And then, you know, there, there are other families like the Browns and the Christians and the Thomases. And there doesn't seem to be a distinction between the original first families of, of Virginia and then the other three families of color that started popping up a couple of generations down the line. And I really, I really like that. It was almost like those communities were safe havens. They were. And they made sure of it because the Africans that could maneuver the legal system, they did, and they protected the others um, in their community. So they they very much so looked out for you know each other. So I'm just going to say, if anyone has any questions, do feel free to pop it in the comments because I keep I keep scanning it. <laughs> So uh, please don't don't be shy. If you do have a question for Catherine, um, do you feel free to ask? And your other huge surprise in the book, and as soon as I read it, I had to phone Donia because she and I both are descended from um, white white Matthews family in South Carolina, who go back to Captain Samuel Matthews in Jamestown, and um, I wasn't expecting that at all, at all. And again, um, it's just the machinations behind the story is just gobsmacking. And you know, with all due respect, Samuel Matthews is my nine times great grandfather. But you know, he's getting into a throwdown with his wife's, I forget what they, they his were. His wife's her, daughter who is um, daughter. married to the governor. He was part of the ousting of, of the governor at that time in, in 1645 to, no, 16, oh, 1645. 16, excuse me, 1635 to 1640. There was two of uh, two oustings of Governor John Harvey, and um, Matthews's daughter-in-law was the new wife of the governor. <laughs> so she had some pull, <laughs> but apparently he did too because he was part of the ousting, and he ended up um, getting quite involved with the Africans. And again, people fighting over people. Yep. Even back then, Don, you raised a very good, uh, very good point. Can you explain a little bit about what head rights are for people who don't, don't aren't familiar with that term? Um, head rights were well, basically they were started by Edwin Sandys, um, who wanted to bring more people to Virginia. So the way that he did it is he said, um, <clears throat> "You you have a say a." a captain, but it, he's not a captain. He's just the head of this piece of property. Um, for each person he brings or that is free of indenture, he can get 50 acres. So the head right, the indenture would, or, or the patent, excuse me, to the property would say his name, list as head rights, these people who basically had rights to the property. So it wasn't an actual deed into their name, but it was a security for them saying that they were the reason that he got that 50 acres. And that 50 acres eventually would come to them once they would finish any kind of uh, term with him. So eventually they would get it. And Margaret did receive 50 acres. And it, she ended up, of course, marrying this man named Robert Sweat. They had four children. And she lived in a place called Sweat House Swamp. And that place still is there to this day and it's named after their family. So they eventually will get that land, but there is some type of contract for it. And they, um, once the contract is, is concluded, they usually get the 50 acres. They usually get two pairs of clothing, which was back then clothing was important. It wasn't easy to come by. They would get um, a specific amount of corn and some type of tools so that they could go on and, and, you know, do their own crops and whatnot. So the head right system was important. Now, remember me telling you all the people that came in um, into Virginia, the 4,600? Yeah. All those were brought under the circumstances, well, many of them were brought as head rights. So if a head right died, the, who had the, the, 
the head man, or I don't know how to how to say his name, but whoever would be the the actual owner of the property, the 50 acres of the person who died would revert back to him. So they would accumulate property quite quickly. It was only the ones that survived that would end up actually getting the property. And it usually would take seven years, five to seven years to get it. So that, I hope I explained head right properly. It's, it's a different type than anything we see today. It's not a sharecropper. They actually had contracts and their names were on the patent, which we today would call a deed. Yep. So it was, it was a step in the process is what it was. Yep. So I guess for every head that you could actually have on your property, like, as you said, you, you got acreage for that. Right. Um, Tiffany, Tiffany Huntsman, yeah, um, you, you don't need to request a copy of the show. Um, it's going to be available uh, as soon as the show is finished to, to watch. It also goes up on YouTube. Uh, I'll do, that'll be done tomorrow. I shouldn't encourage this, but if you Google something like YouTube video download or a Facebook video download, or if you want to download the video, you can, you can do it that way. Now, the head right thing, um, and thank you, Johnny, for asking that, that question, too, brings me to, an, um, to something else. Did the, especially that first generation of, of Africans of Virginia, did they actually have white indentured servants who were head rights on their land? Is there any yeah, evidence of that? Absolutely. Um, Benjamin um, Dahl had them in Surrey County. Um, Anthony Johnson. He had patented 200 acres in Northampton County. He listed his son, John, as a head right and two other European gentlemen. So yes, they actually had indentured servants also. And, but it would be some years later that of course the law would be changed and no longer could an African man have an indentured servant who was European. Right. So the laws continually changed. and But yes, in the beginning, they absolutely did. And that's how they purchased their property. Good. Uh, Carlton Hatton has a question for you, Catherine. Uh, could Miss Knight talk more about cluster genealogy and how that works? If he thinks that this is great. <sighs> well, it's, it's cluster genealogy is any time, it's basically doing genealogy on the entire community. Is what it boils down to because if if someone comes in contact with a one of those individuals it may not be shown or told what about that individual at that specific time but but the person that came in contact with you may have a whole story or a document sitting there and there may be information in that document that leads you back to that african man so you really have to look at every single individual around them in the community in order to get a sense of the entire picture of what was going on. So I hope that kind of helped with the cluster thing. Um, I don't have actually found as much information if I hadn't done it that way, because there's no one book or one document or even an archive, just one, you know, that all this information is in. It doesn't exist that way at all. So, which is um, kind of the genealogy that Donnie and myself and our and our ed, our old ninety six South Carolina people do, because uh, especially with a group like this, within a within a couple of generations, pretty much everyone's related to each other, and then you just have the systemic and dot and dot me that goes for generation after generation. So once you kind of realize that that's the situation that your your ancestry is a part of, cluster genealogy. It's just part and parcel of the research. It is. It becomes yeah. the normal. Uh, Jay Spears has a question for you. Uh, hi, Catherine. We met in Philadelphia last year, the AAHGS conference. Mm -hmm. uh, great chat. Did you uncover much about Samuel Silas Jordan um, of the Jamestown era during your research? And then it said he would have been further upriver near Charles City, which is where a lot of my ancestry comes from. Actually, Jordan. When we talked earlier, Jordan was one of the Af or one of the um, Europeans who had Benjamin Dahl. He was listed on his property. Now, the one he's specifically talking about is is a couple gener generations later. Um, Benjamin Dahl's son, John Dahl, also resided on the Jordan property and stayed there. His wife's name was Isabel. 
Um, I don't have much information on him. He, he, there wasn't a lot in the records, but there is some information about the Jordan attachment to that line. Uh, I don't recall exactly what he is asking me though from the conference. I can't remember his specific comment back then of what it was he asked. And again, touching on the, the kind of what you were, one of the points you made about cluster genealogy is even for this research, there's a lot more that still needs to be done, even though you've done a huge amount. So there's repositories that are going to be in England that's going to have information. There are going to be repositories in Spain that's going to have information. There may or may, may, or may not be even information in Portugal, the Portuguese archive. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. There'll be a contract in, in the Portuguese one that's the actual contract um, that they were shipped out of Angola with. That contract is there. And I... I, it's by a man with the last name of Delvis, D-E-L-V-E-S, I believe, that contracted all those 36 ships being taken the Africans out as slaves. So there's a lot more to, to come across. I will say, um, I had said earlier that I wrote a historical series about the Africans too. And the reason I wanted to mention is because in the very last, there's, gonna, there's three books. There's um, book one, which is... Um, the Middle Passage, book two, which is The Turning Tides, and book three is On Troubled Shores. But there is a book four. It's not a book that continues the story, but it's a book that has all of my research in it. It's called A Research Companion, and it gives all the information, not just about the Africans, about everyone that they touched, all the people in the area, even down to the servants that were listed on the February 23rd, 1623 list of the living, I use their names where they were, the ones that there's also reference to who, you know, the people that died. Um, there's a lot more research out there to be done. But that book, The Research Companion, will have an overload of information in it that's very pertinent to that time period. Excellent. And Tiffany Huntsman is asking, have you made any connection by cluster genealogy back to Angola? Yes and no, through DNA, which she knows. Actually, Tiffany is a cousin. Um, and we do find Y DNA that leads back to Angola. Um, we're working on some DNA to establish a mitocardial. This is kind of my next step in this whole process with, with documenting these Africans is taking the DNA um, of the descendants that we can document, finding the little mutual cinnamorgans that match and then we can actually see that there is a angolan bantu um, bianchi pygmy mix of and that is a mixture of different um dna that's there and it seems to be the same little pieces throughout um the descendants of these africans that specifically that one um and I, I paired with multi-ethnic um, historical um, research associates. And Stacy Webb is the genetic genealogist. She's also a gene um, just a regular genealogist, but she's taken the next step further and gone the, through the genetics part of it, which I'm doing also, but she's quite ahead of me. But she did do a, a research book that references and where how we found Benjamin Dahl's DNA. And from it, we take several, there's excellent charts in there of how to do it. You can buy the workbook and literally put your history in and pull it all the way back to him. Now, from that, we take this DNA database that we put information in, and that's how we're finding this information to pull it to current day. Hopefully, we will find an algorithm so that we can establish this with every single one of the Africans. Um, to date, we have specifically, we know one, I would say 100%. Um, I have documented other ones in a previous DNA data bank that I had. And like I said, we're, we're now working on a subsequent one. And hopefully, my wish is that eventually you'll be able to walk in the library 
upload into computer your DNA or any any computer, but we I want this into a library program and see if that if you actually match through that algorithm any of those first Africans. So my goal is to identify each one of them with through their descendants and find that little bit of DNA. Hopefully we can. I have a lot of naysayers that say you can't go back that far. It's a lot of traffic and static. You don't know what you're doing. But the results from what we have, have in the works sure are showing very positive signs that we're going to be able to do this. So that's exciting. Well, it is exciting because if actually kind of the, if the proof is in the pudding, as the, as the British say, I'm it. Because when we first started talking, I gave you my my autosomal DNA test, and I mean, I already knew that I was that I was descended from from three of them, and you came back with those three names and found a fourth, and we don't know who that is. <laughs> we'll find it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, we haven't been able to work that one out yet. Uh, Harold wants to know if all of your books are published by the same publisher. Yes, it's through First Freedom Publishing. Mm -hmm. and, and I will either at the, there's a website and it's www.firstfreedompublishing.com or he can get them all off Amazon, Barnes and Noble. They're out there. Anybody could find them. If you Google it, it'll come up. Cool. And I'll also post some, post some links to those. And my cousin, Andre Kearns, who's a Kumbo, okay, um, he's got this question. Can Catherine speak to how people claimed land under the ancient landfall bounties? Apparently that's where his Kumbo ancestor got his, uh, 50 acres back in 1667. He actually um, purchased, who he's talking about is Emmanuel Cumbo. That's it. Emmanuel Cumbo, I believe it was 1657 or 67. I'd have to look to remember exactly. Um, he was able to purchase 50 acres. I believe when you look at where that 50 acres came from, that he actually was part of a of what we talked about earlier about the head right system. He actually... Um, received that property. It, the property was from a gentleman who died. It went back into the hands of the, um, the colonials, and then he actually purchased that 50 acres. I would have to say that it, he was probably a head right, but, but because it's in James City County and those records were burned, there's no way for me to know that. Uh, that's a total guess. But he received that in, I want to say, 1667, and I believe him to be um, the second generation of those first Africans. I believe that Emmanuel Cumbo was from, um, in 1628, there was a white man. Um, I'm going to have to look up his name real quick. Andre knows who I'm talking about. Um, and anyway, this man was punished, and he received 30 um, strikes for um, fornication with one of the Africans. He then had, his name is Hugh Davis. He then had to um, go and apologize to the African community. Now, at the time in 1628, I think that would probably had to be a sincere apology. If it would have been in 1640, I would have said probably not, that that was probably a scare tactic or some, some shape, way, or form. But because of the time period in 1628 that it happened, I believe, though, um, Emmanuel Cumbo descends from the African that Hugh Davis was with. Um, the time period Ooh. would probably be correct. Right. Oh, that's interesting. That, that affects me, too. <laughs> so that's interesting. <laughs> We're so intermingled. We really are. <laughs> well, that's, that's the message that Donnie and I, in our own way, try to get out in every single show, because the history has been deliberately obscured in some cases, or just, you know, in other cases, just innocently forgotten. Ameri I don't care what we look like, what we look like on the outside, millions of us are connected to one another in ways that we have no idea. Just, just not. At 35 generations, there are 275 billion, I believe, I will have to look it up, ancestors. At 35 generations, every single person on this planet is related. That's the- Absolutely. So, we're all I just wish, and I claim I wish more. <laughs> <laughs> I wish more people would wake up to that. 
Um, Michelle Harlow has a message for you. She said, Catherine, thank you for all the hard work that you, that you do. Uh, oh, wow, people are compiling in now. Uh, you are very knowledgeable and the information is just so informative. Awesome job. Well, I hope to keep spreading the word because it's very, very important that we get the truth out. Um, I think it's possible that we could have a new understanding of, of really where slavery started, the evils of slavery, how we got there. We weren't always there. There was a time that existed that maybe we can get back to one day because it's so such a division right now within the world. But we are all related and we're one, we're one species, we're humans. Absolutely. And again, you know, having to work together back then, um, well, having to work together, period. Side by side. Should always strengthen, should always strengthen those bonds. And you know, those bonds are clearly there because you can see the mixing between the Africans and the Europeans because a lot of babies didn't appear out of nowhere. It wasn't, right. immaculate, it wasn't immaculate conceptions. Um, and, you know, you actually read tales of how they ran away together. Mm -hmm. um, to escape the to escape their indentured to right so the i wish i guess if there was anything i wish more americans would realize that we share more than we were than we realize because they actually recognize the similarity of their situations even if they had different skin color and that's even putting the native americans in there who are also either indentured mm -hmm. or, or enslaved a little bit later on right all, all three groups realized we're in the same boat so the only way we're going to get through this is if we actually get through this together. And unfortunately, that's, that went by the wayside. I, you say that, and I feel that truly in my soul. I have the Native, the African, and the European mixture, and I feel like we are so much, we, we experience so much from the birth of America together, and those it's in, it's within all of us. So it needs to, I don't know, the truth needs to be told. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen Bertram, who's joining us from Denmark, she's saying, thank you for your time, efforts, and your kind thoughts. Oh, thank you. So believe it or not, we are now actually after five o'clock. I can't believe that that's just gone by, gone by like that. So at this point, I'm just gonna say, it, does anyone else have any questions for, for Catherine while she's here? because if not, we'll start to wrap things up. But thank you again. It's just, um, there's just so much to go over and there are a lot, there's so much I actually wanted to talk about in the book, but I want people to read, to buy the book and read it. <laughs> yes, so, um, yeah. there'll be more to come. So I'm sure we'll, <laughs> this will be extended one day. <laughs> there's a lot more to come. Absolutely. But I thought the most obvious question, how long did this actually take you to research? Um, to date, it's 13 years. I quit documenting at 20,000 hours. I felt there was no more reason to document <laughs> my time. It was too much early. <laughs> so there's a lot of time there, but it's a passion and it's something within me that needs to be told or revealed or to educate people or there's something there and that's what I'm doing. Well, that brings me nicely to um, probably more towards a closing point. What I hope is that there will be a philanthropic kind of a unicorn, funding unicorn, that will watch the video and see the value of the work that you've done and stump up some money to further the research. To because there there still are blanks. Oh. Um, there's there's one person um, in particular, Yardley, I believe it, 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 I believe it was. We know he held. We know he held some of the first Africans of Virginia. You kindly share with me what some of those names were, but there's another, was it five? Five, we have no idea who they are. There's there's several that we do not know. And, you know, the more people research, the more information will get revealed. And we just have to do the research. So hopefully, I, I hope that we can get some type of funding. That would be wonderful to move forward with the research, because I'm sure there's a lot more there than what I have been covering. Well, again, I'm sure the, the Corporation of London Records, because again, that was the body that oversaw the, the foundation of the colony with the Earl of Warwick. Uh, the Corporation of London should have, you know, that archive and the British archives 
should have information, the British archives itself. We were talking, you know, I was joking with you going, I wonder if the Earl of Warwick's descendants have any of any of his letters from this period of time. Because his letters are going to be really revealing. And then you showed me a book that's like, well, letters from Barbados. Uh, <laughs> where, where some of those some of those right. were but as I said, you know, there's a trip to Spain, the Spanish archive, the Portuguese archives. Um, you said the ship was built in Japan. I mean, this is really is such an international story. I'd love to know, you know, the, what instructions were given to the Japanese to build the ship. Oh, those are there. Absolutely, yeah. those are there. There's a San Juan Batista Museum, which is where I got the specifications to um, even know what the ship looked like. But that ship is rebuilt sitting in their harbor. So it's, it's a pretty magnificent that it's even there or that they have the specifications to do it. Um, it's quite amazing, that ship. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that there might be even something in the Bermuda archives because that, that was a stop. Yeah, I found a lot in Bermuda. I've been able to get into the Bermuda archives. The web, the internet has brought it. Until now, there's no way that I could have done this 15 or 20 years ago um, before we had the internet to be able to put all the archived information. Genealogists all over the world have, that has been goals for us to do, and it links all of our information together. That is the, if you're a genealogist, that is the best thing that you can do is um, be able to archive information so that we can see it. And now it's on the internet and it's just, it's a wonderful thing. Like I said, 30 years ago, we didn't have it and we would not have put this story together 30 years ago. There's no way. And as I said, I just hope that there's someone out there who is either watching it or sees the video who could have, you know, who can put the money forward to fund it, who just wants to, you know, wants the truth to be told and isn't afraid of the truth, being, the truth being revealed. Because it is what it is. It is. And his history is so important. It really is. Hi, Henry. Um, yes, as soon as as soon as we finish the broadcast, it will be immediately available on Genealogy Adventures uh, Facebook page. We have a little video tab. Um, it'll be there. It'll also be in our in our main timeline on our Facebook page, and it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So diff different ways of accessing it. So I'm going to wrap things up. Um, what I will say is. This is going to be the last of this season. Um, such a special show, I've got to say. So wonderful way to kind of close out the season. Again, so sorry that Dawn couldn't be here with us. Um, fortunately, she had to work today. So we will be back with you in September. We have a huge surprise for you in terms of September. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm just going to tease you like that. You're just going to have to tune in in September to see what the change is going to be. Um, so again, thank you everyone for well, giving a character Catherine, such a warm welcome, and uh, for all of your brilliant questions and for sharing um, your Friday with us. So with that, I'm going to say this is Brian Sheffy from Genealogy Adventures saying have a good day. Take care. All right, bye-bye. And if you can stay on the